Welcome to Conversation on Eagle Mountain, a podcast about the tribe. I'm your host, Lance, and joining me on the panel today is Liz, Hill, and Sabine, with episode notes done by myself and Kata. So, welcome, everyone. Hey, hey. Hi. Hello. So, episode four, the screenplay was done by Valerie Georgeson, and it was directed once again by Wayne Terrell. Uh, so, we have the episode synopsis read out by Hill. Bray and Trudy have been voted out of the tribe, but it seems Trudy's contractions have started, prompting Lex to suspect a con. Throughout the day, while Trudy's labor drags on, Dal volunteers to venture out into the city to find supplies for the baby. Chloe secretly feeds and plays with the calf, and Patsy and Paul continue to blackmail Jack for food from his secret store. So the episode kicks off by continuing a cliffhanger from the previous episode, where we see Trudy suddenly gripped with pain. I'm not having this. You've no choice. We can't throw her out now. I suppose it's true, Lex. It's true. First she was too hungry to go, then she was too tired. Now she's having labor pains. She must think we're stupid. Trudy, do you think it might be a false alarm? Well, we won't know until she's rested. Listen to him. It's a put up job. They're in it together. So yeah, though Bray and Trudy were originally voted out of them all, the situation, of course, has now changed. Um, Thinking back on that scene, uh, did you originally think that you sided with Lex and it was indeed a con? Or did you actually believe that um, what was happening was actually real? She was totally faking. <laughs> <laughs> she was absolutely not. I mean, yeah, but at first I thought it was. Because it's too good not to be. You know, you've been voted out, you're on your way out. And then suddenly, all of a sudden, you're having this baby? Like, no. No, 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 no. Yeah, she, she had been having pains all day. But she hadn't said anything about it yet. <laughs> had she? I don't know. The mm. timing was suspicious though, wasn't it? It was very suspicious. Like, even if like she was in labor all day and having pain, like she seemed fine up until that moment. Like, they were sitting on the sofa making eyes at each other, her and Bray, while they were voting. And, and nobody said anything that moment. And the second they're like tossing them out, it's like, oh, wait, baby. I, I totally understand why the kids were suspicious. I mean, like you said, the timing, um, they've just been thrown out. They've just made a, you know, Bray's just made a big fuss about it. It'd be very convenient for her to just be like, oh, oh no, I'm, I'm having the baby. And yeah. it doesn't help the things that Bray is saying. He's like, well, she, we won't know until she lays down and, Lex is like, okay, yeah, this is a con. But as soon as her water breaks, it's like, Lex, don't ignore the facts. This girl's in labor. Oh, yeah, and I think that's as soon as the labor breaks. Like, that's when they realize that she's actually in labor. Oh, yeah, everybody else but him. He's, he's still convinced. They're having us on. Like, she totally faked it. Once again, as someone who doesn't know how babies work, it's totally possible that he no, didn't realize. No, it's not. It is not. No, Hill, I know you love Lex, but come on. I know. Don't ignore no. the facts. This is Lex being a jerk because he's not getting what he wants. Everybody in the group knew when her water broke, the baby was coming. Even the kids stepped back. They knew what that meant. Everybody knew what it meant. Lex I didn't know what that meant. You were nine. Lex is 16 <laughs> years old. He has taken 10th grade biology. He knows. Okay. I know you want to stick up for him, but let's just face it. He's being a dick. Yes, he was. But still. That's what Lex does best. I agree with you, he was being a dick, but he also thought it was a con. I get it. Water bottles up there. You could have just like squirted water out on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Not the same. Not the same. <laughs> Following on from that, obviously the tribe is now like just be trying to hold on to this like sense of democracy and this like a sense they are becoming a tribe. So do you think that the vote should have been up upheld and that Trudy and Bray should have been expelled from the tribe like after the birth? Or do you think that, yeah, now the situation has completely changed? I think it's more important to do what's right than to be right. And I think that's something they realize when the baby is coming, when the baby has arrived. You know, it may have, you know, it, the right thing to do would have been to uphold their vote and still make them leave. Yeah. That would have been 
technically the right thing to do because that's what they voted. That's what the majority had decided. But that doesn't mean it would have been right. You know what I mean? And I think that's that emotional place where you reach the gray area. Um, at that point, it is very different for all of them. When the baby wasn't there, it was easy to say, it's not our responsibility. We don't want anything to do with it. You know, but as soon as the baby's there, they can't look it in the face and say, get out. You know, none of them can. And uh, that that's that's humanity. That's what makes us human. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I totally get why they couldn't uphold that decision, why they were not comfortable upholding that decision. And um, that's kind of probably why they wanted it gone as soon as possible before they had to actually see this child and throw it out on the street. Um, but now it's here. So do you think that um like amber should have pushed for a second vote like yeah. later down the line i'm because i'm on the opposite side like you know the vote was we're kicking you guys out and you know take the time you need to get settled once the baby's born and like can somewhat not really function but like isn't fresh out in the world um but just like they do in the hospitals just because you have your baby in the hospital doesn't mean you stay there for all eternity like your baby is good. You are good. Go on. Figure out your life. Goodbye. But that's the thing. Once the baby's come, the majority has changed its mind. You know, if they had, I mean, maybe they should have had a second vote, but it seemed very clear. I think clear. they should have been. At the table, they basically are voting again. And the majority this time is saying we can't throw them out. Mm. You know, and um, it basically counts as a second vote. They've changed their mind. You may not like that they changed their mind. But they have. Reality has changed their minds. And I think they, I really think that the moment that baby was there, they just couldn't do it anymore. Because then there was a face to the tiny person they wanted to throw out. It was an actual person. Mm -hmm. I'm the cynic. It's easy to ignore a concept. But I mean, that's the point. That's what, that's what the show is about. It's very easy to talk about these moralistic issues when you're not face to face with them. Um, most people live their whole lives while there are other human beings on the planet who are scraping in the dirt just so that we can be comfortable. But because we don't see them, we don't think about it. We don't stop buying iPhones despite the children who work on them in factories in unsavory conditions. We know of it, we know it exists, we know, but we don't have to see it. So we keep living our lives. But if you had to look this kid in the face, a child that you know is getting pennies a day so that you can boss Siri around, would you be comfortable using that phone? That's how it works. You know, they see the baby now. They cannot throw it out. Yeah. It's strangely similar to what happens later on with Bluebell. Ha, huh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bluebell's cuter. <laughs> oh. All, baby All baby animals are cuter than humans. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's it. They see Bluebell, they know they want meat, but they see the cow, and they can't eat the cow. Because now they know her. <laughs> now they have to do it, that's too much. Oh my goodness. One of my favorite scenes, actually. <laughs> do you know anything about delivering babies? Not really. Sandra? Me. <sighs> You're joking. <sighs> Never mind. Birth natural, isn't it? All we've got to do is follow our instincts. We'll manage. Well, suppose something goes wrong. Oh, we're going to need scissors and rubber bands, lots of clean rags and tissues. Oh, and soap. What? You mean you? Any objections? You heard the man who's got some soap. Speaking of babies, like, um, how impressed were you that Bray single-handedly took charge and helped deliver the baby. I mean, you have Celine, Zandra and Amber who were pretty much clueless and didn't know what to do. Just here comes along Bray. He knows exactly what to do. Were you impressed by his knowledge at all? Do, do we ever know what Bray's parents did? Because like, while I was watching that, I was like, the only way he would know what to do is if his mom was one of those weird hippie mm -hmm. chicks who like did home births. No. And had Bray around as like a helper. 
Nope. Actually, uh, no. Um, all he has to do is read the freaking baby books. Yeah. <laughs> oh, see. I'm done. sorry. I'm just. That was my first thought. He read the ba- when I was brain's yeah. age. I was kind of obsessed with knowledge and stuff like that. So yeah, I could have totally give like birthed a baby when I was 16, 17 years old. And I mean, he's been. Uh, he has a reason to have read the books and find out what he needs to do. And he's o- he's only using common sense. You know what I mean? Like once you've had a baby or you've watched a birth, you recognize Bray's not doing anything outstanding or spectacular. He's using common sense. That's all he's doing, you know? Yeah. And um, I mean, it's impressive, especially if you're a child. Absolutely. Like, holy crap. How does he know how to do this stuff? Um, but yeah, he, he's... He- he had he months to prepare. He had plenty of time to prepare. In fact, okay, this actually makes me angry, and I have to just say it. <laughs> Here is Bray. He is birthing a child. He knew he'd have to do this, so he clearly made sure he studied up so he'd know exactly what he had to do. And yet, in all that time, this man didn't real- make sure he had the supplies that he sends everyone to get the last minute. I'm like, Bray, you knew you were going to need scissors. You could have picked up scissors at any time. Why didn't you get elastics? Why didn't you have some towels and things to sterilize? How could you be so prepared and yet no, not prepared, Bray? Yeah, it, it goes back to that, like the timeline query of how long since they've been on the run from the locos. Like he could have had the supplies mm. back there, but yeah, we don't know how long. He was in Trudy's house. Are you telling me he could have found some useful things in her house? Oh yeah, that's true. Surely they had scissors. <laughs> It drove me crazy. I'm like, how could he have taken the time to make sure he'd know what to do, but then waited to the last minute to... These are small items he could have easily carried around in his bag and had the whole time. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I'm not the only one who's annoyed at that. (laughs) It was still quite impressive. (laughs) For his age, it was impressive, but the fact that they had to rely on Ryan to find rubber bands, which he didn't... (laughs) He got distracted. ADHD is the thing. Mm-hmm. But still, I mean, why get yourself to the point that you have to rely on someone else for that? What would he, he have done if her labor had started like three streets further? <laughs> That's so true. Uh, Ask the demon dog for a pair of scissors? <laughs> he definitely was waiting for the last minute. That's so sure. I just had a thought, like um, jumping ahead to season three um, Mm -hmm. and Amber's like so-called resurrection, um, you have that flashback where Ebony shows Amber a picture of uh, herself and Bray with um, a a baby. Oh, yeah. A friend's baby. Do you think that could have been like where you picked up the knowledge originally from? Maybe. Could be, but so makes me wonder, you know... If he had a close friend who had a baby that small and he knew Trudy was pregnant, why not go to her for help or experience? Maybe something had happened with her and she's not around anymore. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Like, yes. she's like probably not around anymore. I know guys like you. After they get what they want, they split. Not me, Zan. And leave the girl pregnant. I know where I've been. I can't say the same for you. I'm clean. Clean as a whistle. Okay, so let's move on to um, Zandra and Lex here. Um, yeah, because they have like what I always thought was a really eye-opening but really subtle exchange, like an allusion to kind of uh, sexual health. Yeah. It was um, really well done. But um, back then, do you... Did you know what they were actually talking about, or did it just go completely over your head? Absolutely went over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I was a teenager in high school. I knew. I'm believe, I believe it or not, it actually the first time I heard the conversation, I didn't assume that's what they were referencing because I thought, again, I thought I'm watching a kids show. They're not yeah. going to talk about that. Right? So I just, I mean, I knew she was referring to you know the fact that she didn't trust him and she didn't know if he'd sleep with her and run off, and I was already impressed by that. So when he says I'm clean as a whistle, I, you know, I was like, they must, and they must be inferring something else, you know, because they wouldn't put that in a kid show. But then later I was like, no, no, that's exactly what you yeah. thought. <laughs> yeah. Later on, I was like, wow, that, that really, that was said and major <laughs> props. But as a kid, I was like, later, like, because there's that scene with, uh, 
Ryan and Jack with the whistle. I was like, oh, whistles, a thing this episode. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Foreshadowing. I was nine. I was dumb. But I do like how that conversation, it, if you hadn't caught on by now, you, this is when you realize these writers are not talking down to its, their audience. Yeah. You know, um, the solo episode is very impressive with how accurate it tries to be to real life, even though it could totally get away with taking shortcuts because its audience is young and doesn't know any better. For example, Hill, I mean, you were nine when this, this came out. Yeah. You, did you know how long a labor is supposed to take? You know what I mean? Nope. And, Once again, like, I didn't even realize that she was, pr like, until Baby, like, was on the scene crying, like, I was very much past the, like, oh, no she was pregnant like what so yeah like the writers they didn't have to be accurate about how long a labor can take most tv shows adults don't portray that accurately you know so it's just those small details that um i thought were really cool that even though they're dealing with kids a young audience they still go for realism and they go as hard as they can yeah this is this is why i love the tribe because yeah there's a lot of great and really serious messages inside it. And I, I like, yeah, I liked how they didn't fast forward the labor. It took time. They showed the passage of time that it wasn't easy. <laughs> that was good. One, day, one thing that always did annoy me during that labor of Trudy was something Bray said, though. I just can't let it go. Because um, at some point, Bray makes this very, very obnoxious comment. Sure, I'm trying to find it. Because uh, he's going on about... Yeah, no, Bra Bray says uh, that she has to take a moment to relax. How on earth is a woman giving, who's giving birth going to take a moment to relax? That's what they tell you to do between pushing you. Yeah. They, they tell you you have to rest, even though it's almost impossible. Yeah. That's, that's exactly, but he's just telling her what she has to do. That's what, the, dude, your nurse practitioner will tell you, your midwife will tell you, your doula will tell you. They will always tell you, try to rest in between pushing. So it may sound obnoxious, but he's just saying what he probably read that he's supposed to tell her. Yeah, that's what I, like, now that I'm older, that's what I realized. Was because that. she was having a really long labor and mm -hmm. exhaustion can be a very high risk in that situation. Yeah. And, you know, some women can push and push for hours to the point where they can't do it anymore. And it's not like they have any way to just pull the baby out, you know. So he needs her to rest up so that she'll have the strength to push when she has to. And no, it's not fun to hear it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not fun to hear it. Anybody telling you to push or relax. You're just like, can you relax? <laughs> I, I think Bray's just very lucky that he was in the state that she was able to punch him. <laughs> Man, you guys don't like Bray. <laughs> I can't oh, wait. <laughs> I, I, I like Bray, but, you know, I can... Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to have to start defending him a bit more. <laughs> I know, I'm like, Man, I was on there. I gotta, I gotta start pulling out my Bray cards. <laughs> I normally like Bray. It's just the, in that moment, I could have fully imagine, imagined her getting mad at him for saying that. Oh, she could have, I would have been mad at him for breathing on me. <laughs> yeah. That's how it feels. Like, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter how rational or good they're being to you. They're just, stop it, this hurts, leave me alone. <laughs> yes, just get this thing out of me. And I think Antonia did a really great job uh, portraying that birth because I felt it. I felt it. I was like, sweetie, mm. when she was crying, I'm like, oh, I wanted to hug her so bad. I'm like, I remember that. I know how that feels. Sweetie, it's okay. When she screams, I want my mom. I'm like, oh, my God, honey, I'm so sorry you're going through this. Like, know how much this hurts. And you can see it in her face because that's all you want to do. It hurts so much. You just want to cry, you know, like, make it stop. Please, somebody make it stop. And. She sold it. She did. Yeah. I give her props for yeah. being, like, acting that out. But apparently that wasn't her first time. She had actually done no. a yeah. show right before that. And she was in an episode where, again, she was a young mother who had to give birth. But still, like, even being a young child actor, having to already do that a second time, like, that's crazy. Oh, super impressive. That they, you know, that even, like, your first go around was impressive enough for 
casting to be like, yo, we know you've done this before. <laughs> Go with it. You know, at what? 14, 16, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, so impressive. Like, even if they watched your reel and they saw you at that age and they're like, well, your character wasn't going to be pregnant, but that was impressive. Let's write this in for you. And that's still pretty <laughs> impressive. Like, <laughs> And I think the actors around her did a really good job too. Um, yeah, Dwayne was great, you know, as her coach. I really felt his his anxiety, you know, and trying to just he, he you know he cares about her. Whatever doubts you might have had about their relationship, he cares about this girl. He's going to get her through this. Um, I love the girls, Amber and Celine and uh, Zondra in the background, and the way they're reacting to this. They're just because you know watching something like that is hard. You know, it, it's it's really tough. You, there's nothing you can do. You you can't help this person. You just have to listen to them in pain. And you're like, are they dying? Like, what happens? What, you know? And I just thought the whole scene was very brilliant, and very well written. They did a great job. Ryan, what are you doing? Nothing. What have you got in that rucksack? Personal items. Uh, shifting gears a little bit. Um, I know we briefly touched on it last week, but um, let's talk about it a little bit here. Um, Ryan's rucksack of money. <laughs> I am standing by my thoughts on that one. <laughs> okay. Um, what do you think about, I mean, let's just think about it in the way like, the, the way Lex led him on a bit. Led him on a bit, let's just say that. I, I finally liked Lex in that moment. No. See, he, I still don't think he led him on. He, they thought that maybe in a few weeks, in a few months, in a year, things would get back to normal and we would need money. And we were clever enough to think about this. So now no, when life I, does return, we have money. No, I can't give him that. Like uh, Lex's expression, he knew he knew exactly what he was doing to Ryan. His expression said it all. He knew he was teasing him. He was mocking him. I think maybe like it had gone too long and maybe they thought it wasn't coming back the way they thought. But I still think originally. I'm going to have to agree with Lance. I mean, I'll give Lex the benefit of the doubt that when they first, when everything first fell apart, he thought possibly the money would be of worth to them. But it didn't take Lex long before he knew oh, money isn't coming back. And just uh -huh. the look on his face when he's telling Ryan, oh, yeah, Ryan, we're going to be okay, thanks to you. He's mocking him, yeah. you know? He knows that Ryan hasn't figured it out, and he's kind of enjoying the fact that Ryan hasn't figured it out. Yes, I do honestly think that he doesn't tell Ryan because it means something to Ryan. Yeah, but, I think he's protecting his friend. He's still, he's still amused at Ryan's naivety. He's having fun poking fun at ryan he's, i think he's he's, he's, he's trying he's, look at that face look at he he's a smug git he, knows <laughs> yeah, he was very smug he's yeah he's just like oh yeah ryan thank goodness we have you looking out for us <laughs> like wow you're a jerk i think i think a lot of what lex does is he takes control of the situation and it's kind of his way of letting Ryan have a bit of the glory, even though it's misdirected. But I think that's what he's trying to do is like, hey, you have an equal opportunity in this friendship. And because of you, we have this money. He knows it's not worth anything right now, but he's too, he doesn't want to crush his friends, like finally doing thing in the group. I would believe that if Lex didn't take such joy in crushing Ryan so much in the future. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I have to he has no problem crushing Ryan whenever it suits him. So yeah, sorry, Kim, I, I'm not with you on this one, Hill. For once, I may be. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. See, thank you, Sabine. It's thank a miracle. <laughs> but to me, Lex just came across as being nice to Ryan for once in his lifetime. Hey. More than once. What? I don't know. I'm, I'm not saying he didn't have ulterior motives with it, though. He came across as nice to Ryan because it suited him. Yes. That's fair. Because... And I will give you that. He, he knew that with this baby arriving, there may be people changing their minds, and he had to make sure Ryan wouldn't be one of them. Yeah. He needed Ryan to be his guy. Absolutely. 
Yeah. I mean, following on from that, obviously, later on in the tribal gathering, it obviously all comes to a head. What did you think of that moment where Ryan rushes back to get the money to show Ebony and the Locos? I mean, that was quite a... <sighs> it's cute. Like, he still hasn't gotten it. Like, he still thinks it's worth something. Lex should have, by that time, by that point, he should have let him down and told him the truth. Like, that, that was just... I want to say that that was a callback to this episode because I don't think it was ever a thing. And it was just kind of like forgotten about. So it could have slipped Lex's mind in all of this that, oh yeah, this guy is still carrying around this hunk of cash. Like, and so in that moment, Ryan's like, oh wait, I have this bag of money. I can do this. This is the moment I've waited for. It's quite a like, soul crushing moment when he realizes that, yeah. yeah, this is all worthless. It's all useless. Like Lex should have broke it, broke it down to him earlier. He really should. Like, he should have. I think. I think it slipped so, his mind. It, it always hurts my feelings in the sense my heart breaks for Ryan because he was clearly saving that money for him and Lex, right? Yeah. You know, that's who he was saving it for. So they were going to be rich. They were going to be okay when this was over. And yet, in that moment, Ryan was willing to spend that money to buy back Amber and Dal. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. It says so yeah. much about how. How much he was like, he's in it for this tribe now. He's there. You know what I mean? He's buying into it. We are a group. We got to look out for each other. I'm going to do my part. And, you know, usually Ryan's part is throwing a punch to protect someone. Here he's like, I can do something. I can do something to help out. We need to get them back. I've got money. And I'm willing to spend the money I've been saving and hoarding protectively for weeks and months. And I will spend it to save them. Only to find out. It's not worth anything. They all laughed in his face, and he's so confused. Like, what? I, I can buy them. You know, I mean, it's a slave auction. Why can't I? And it just breaks my heart because I'm just like, oh my gosh. It does yeah. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan, you darling sweetheart, come here. Let me dunk you in my hot chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I I do really love Ryan, so I I'm um, okay. I will defend yeah. him a lot. So yeah, <laughs> I love Ryan. And I love what Amber says. She's just like, thanks, Ryan. You know, because she, she gets it. Like, it's not worth anything. But she definitely appreciates the gesture. Like, you know, thanks, guy. That was really cool of you. Sorry, it's not worth anything. Push! It's taking so long. Ah! That's it, you're doing it. The Ted's appeared. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> you're nearly there, Trudy. Uh, let's talk about just how heartwarming was it to have the, the entire tribe around um, supporting the birth. It was quite a nice moment um, to see everyone like cheering Trudy on, like to have the baby, um, and then they're preparing gifts. Um, yeah, what do you think about that little touching scene? It's pretty cute, I admit. Yeah. Um, when you think about how long she's been in labor, and then finally something's happening, and it's it's a glimpse at what these guys can be. You know, it like they're not a tribe yet. They don't trust each other yet. They're just a bunch of people living in this space right now. And this right here is a peek at what they can yeah. be when they come together. And it is really sweet, a little gushy, a little more fluffy than I prefer. But <laughs> I, oh. I get me. It, it gets me. I'm like, oh. But it is. It's one of those like kids moments again, where you know, it's just it's a peek at the tribe without being. Like, on your nose, we're a tribe. So, you know, it's probably we need something to fill in this gap. We didn't write it. Let's just roll and see what happens. And it's endearing. The thing I found most adorable about that was Chloe with her mobile. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, she actually realized this is something a baby would like. And, oh, I can make this. Yeah. It, is, it was useful, too. <laughs> yeah, it was useful. <laughs> it was Chloe. You resourceful little thing. Look at all your shiny pieces of garbage. <laughs> you all, C came up with it. I mean, Patsy and Paul wanted to give the baby sweeties. Well, yeah, but that, I, once again, I'd be the dumb kid of like, hey, let's give some chocolate. I was I was quite surprised by Jack, like, giving the weights. Like, I was really surprised that that was something that he would kind of know. I wouldn't have known that. <laughs> Wait, what did, he, what did Jack, I thought Jack gave him the weights. A scale. A oh, scale. It, that was not Jack's gift, that was Celine's. He was just carrying it. Oh, okay. Oh. oh, I thought it was Jack's gift too. 
no, she leaned, she was like, that's for me. And, you know, and then Patsy's like, what do you need a scale for? And blah, blah, blah. Right. Did yeah, I was like, I don't know you people. I don't got a gift for this. <laughs> uh, see? Yeah, it was mine, gift. Mind blown. Oh, it's Jax. <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, I, I mean, it's awkward if you suddenly, like, came up with something. Well, you know? Jax, like, I gave, Jax, like, I gave you the mall. Yeah, <laughs> it's, <your> home. <laughs> maybe I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's better than Ryan giving it a whistle. <laughs> <laughs> and Jack's face is so pissed off at that. <laughs> so funny. He's like, "Hey, I got this whistle." And Jack's like, "Yo, that's mine." <laughs> so he love gets it. it back later. I know. I love, so this is another thing. I love tracking, like, the little, like, the whistle and the teddy bear and, like, certain things throughout the seasons. Like, oh. Chloe's teddy bear right now, I think, Lex has because he used it as a pillow or Ryan has. No, oh, Ryan um, gave it back. He gave it Ryan back. Gave, okay, so yeah. Chloe has it back now again. But it's just funny to watch these things, like, float around. Yeah, it is. And, like, props even, like, at one point, May has Lex boots and it's just it's fun to watch the evolution of the stuff this can't go on you know all of you and it's not just food it's water batteries everything i mean look at you two playing a computer game jack said we could we've got to set up some system of rationing rationing yes ryan we can't afford to waste anything oh yeah so um towards the end of the episode we have amber introduced the concept of rationing Obviously, this plays a big part in the next episode, but um, what's everyone's thoughts about the food situation within the mall? On the one hand, you have Chloe giving away their meager supplies um, to feed Bluebell, uh, and then on the other, you've got Jack and his secret supply of food. Um, yeah, what do you think about the concept of rationing? When you have a group of people that are together that don't really have cohesive bonds, like up until this point, they really haven't done anything to become a tribe in one unit like there's always going to be people keeping things and i think it's very believable like if you invaded my mall thing you know back or if i didn't quite trust you guys i would hold things back like you know it just they need they need something at this point to kind of give them reason to share and we we do eventually get that catalyst but up until this point we don't have it it's real it's really rough because everybody has a different value system as to what is um worth feeding or what you know who gets what and uh so even if you get a bunch of people to agree that rationing is the logical thing you're gonna have somebody who says well we shouldn't feed the dog you know and another person can be like we're feeding the dog you know what i mean there's just and yet, it, it, you know, there's an argument for both sides. Like, we shouldn't feed animals if we're not going to get anything from them. Um, and I don't know what I would do in a desperate situation. Would I continue feeding my house cat? Or would I be like, you're, you're on your own, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't know what I would do. But I, I can understand that being an argument. What do you do? Um, and it's, it is hard to get everyone on the same page. And that also fosters more distrust because these people don't know each other. They can't rely on each other and when you're trying to have a conversation about what should be done and nobody can agree it only encourages you to keep hoarding what little you can get your hands on and um and i also think it's interesting that they each have their own i their own um <laughs> opinion as to what is important to rational uh, ration and yet they're complete hypocrites about it you know, um, on one hand, Lex says we shouldn't feed the dog because it's a pet that doesn't give us anything, but he's stealing water from everybody else. So he doesn't really care about rationing, you know. Yeah. And then, of course, you have Jack who agrees that rationing is something they should do. And, of course, he agrees to it because he has an entire food store he can eat whenever <laughs> right. he wants. And so it's just things like that. It's I feel really bad for Amber. She's watching all these people at the table, stuffing their faces, using all the batteries. And like, you guys. But that's the one thing Jack actually has a real op honest opinion about. The batteries. Because he can't get more. Yeah. Or he knows he's got food. He doesn't have batteries. Exactly. Yeah, that brings up a, like another point as well. Like, 
knowing that they're re- so really low on food, like should there have been a bigger push, a bigger drive to go and find more food? Yes, absolutely. I think priorities were always something that got shuffled around in the tribe. Like we're prioritizing things that probably shouldn't be, but you know, we don't all need to sit around and watch this baby being born or sit on the step and watch. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. No, we can be doing other things. That, this is where I'm like, yeah, these are a bunch of kids because this is such a kid thing. Like oh, when yeah. you see kids, they all complain about being told what to do, right? Mm-hmm. We want to be able to do whatever we want. But when they're given complete freedom, that mall is chaos. And they complain about the fact that it's chaos, that there are no clean dishes and that there's no food. And it's like, yeah, because you don't want, you want to be able to do whatever you want. Just like you said, they're sitting around while a baby's being born. Nobody's doing anything useful except, you know, Chloe with her mobile. (laughs) (laughs) And you have Lex who complains about food all the time, but like never actually scavenge this for food. You know, he never brings food into the mall. Not once. That's the he- point. Yeah. <laughs> never <laughs> once. once a- he almost did. You know, kind he of. got distracted. They, they found he and Dal <laughs> food and came back with a head of lettuce they found in the trash. Why? Because Lex <laughs> said, let's play baseball. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, but, I mean, and my point is, these are a bunch of kids who complain that they need things, that they want things, but none of them want to have to work for those things. They want a clean environment to live in. None of them want to clean. They want batteries to last, but none of them want to ration them. You know, so I'm like, yeah, these kids, these are totally kids. <laughs> they make me want to pull my hair out, but it's so <laughs> realistic. Celine actually seems the most mature at that. Well, Celine and Amber. Is. Yeah, well, I feel so far sorry for her. <laughs> <laughs> you, you brought up a good point. Lex never once goes to fetch water or gets food or <laughs> he, he does. <laughs> he does? He does. Yeah, he does. Yeah. When? when he goes to Alice. Uh-huh. He's getting- that was for the wedding. For his wedding. It was still food and it's drink. So no, that was for the wedding. That was for yeah. himself. That, that doesn't count. And he wouldn't have done it if it wasn't Sasha who suggested, dude, take the batteries to a farm and trade for food. Otherwise, he would have sat on his ass. <laughs> but it was a good point, and he went and got it. Yeah, Le- Lex isn't a scavenger. He, he doesn't provide. <laughs> but, okay... You're right, Lex isn't a scavenger. He cons, and he'd rather con to get whatever he needs than actually go out and look for it. Just once, I'd love an unbiased opinion from you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it, I'm sorry. Oh, oh we'll come uh, when we get to the Zandra episode. Uh, it, yeah. it, it makes it, oh, yeah. it, makes it harder for me to take it seriously. I'm like, I know. She, here comes the enabler over here. <laughs> the, I, he runs around in my brain. He runs around in my brain, and I can't help it. (laughs) What are you laughing at? He went out soon after the baby was born. He's probably having a sleep somewhere, poor thing. You just don't want to see it, do you? What? Have you kids seen him? No. Of course they haven't. He's done a runner yet, the kids. He can have. He loves his little baby. He did go off without a word. Dumping his girlfriend and brat on us. What does he take us for? You must think we're loving lads. I don't believe it. How could he? Well, if he thinks he can treat us like that, he's got enough to think, kind. And what about Trudy? Fancy going off and leaving her like that. And who's going to be the one to tell her? So what's everyone's final thoughts on the episode? Um... Yeah, like, what was everyone's like, immediate reaction to discovering that Bray had vanished straight after the birth? Did you think, oh, oh yeah, here we go. He, he's played everyone for a fool. Yeah. <laughs> or do you think that he genuinely left um, for some space and some air? Um... <laughs> I feel like whatever I say will have to get bored. <laughs> so I'm just going to just, just, uh, boop, and then that's, that's what I say about that. I honestly could not believe he would leave her. Yeah. He's done it so many times, though. Yeah, but I believed in his innocence. and But, but I think it's part to do with where I grew up. Like, even in my high school, there wasn't, you know, we didn't really have single parents. I didn't think he was leaving uh, Trudy. One, it just didn't make any sense why. If he was going to leave her, why didn't he just do it before the baby was born? 
he could have ditched her so many times. But um, the reason I didn't think he was leaving is because of the look they share before he leaves the room. It's very clear that they're a moment of understanding. He gives her this knot. She gives him. She knows he's going somewhere. I was just curious as to what he was doing. I knew he was coming back. I knew he hadn't ditched her. But I was like, is he going to betray this tribe? <laughs> because I was just, it was a very shady thing when he left. And I didn't know what he was leaving for. But I knew he wasn't leaving Trudy. That was obvious. But uh, it was just, you know, it was a writer's trick to make everybody, you know, leave us with a, a cliffhanger and get the suspicion going. I mean, it makes sense that the others think he's leaving because, well, they don't trust him. They don't have a reason to. But, uh, and a lot of them want to think the worst of Ray. His timing does suck, though, doesn't it? Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. And I mean, he he had left before with Trudy, and he had done things. So I think at that point, it is plausible that he just ran out on her. When had he left her, according to those guys? Like, like why would... Why? Well... And what we know about he came him. to the mall. He came to the mall. He stayed there overnight. He came to the mall without, and her. he came back for her. So there's no reason to believe he'd leave Trudy. It still annoys me to this day that he left her out in the city somewhere, yeah, in the dark on her own without even know, you know. And now bridge. <laughs> he left her on her bridge, though, didn't it? <laughs> oh, he left her, on her, but now that she has been someplace safe and everything, he's left her. But she's not safe. Was- She's not safe at the mall. These people didn't want her there. They just voted her out. And if he didn't care about her, why did he stay with her while she was pregnant? None of that makes any sense. Ray ditching Trudy now doesn't make sense. Nope. But like I said, everybody else thinking he did does. And again, they, they had that secret look. It's like, it just never, I never for a second believed he was ditching Trudy. I was just like, what are you going to do? Are you going to betray these guys? What are you going to do, Ray? <laughs> But again, it was just one of those writer's tricks, you know, like, ooh, cliffhangers, everything, the way they filmed it, making it all ambiguous, blah, blah, blah. You know he's coming back. <laughs> but everybody else has to get an uproar about it, because they don't even wait for him to be gone an hour before they decide he's gone. <laughs> I love that so much. Like, why don't you guys give it a little while before you've decided he's abandoned her and the child? They're already discussing, who's going to tell her? I, I quite like that scene where everyone was like, yeah, I, I can't tell Tuji. Like, <laughs> everyone was like, no, yeah. no not me. <laughs> not me. Not it. But it's also very much kids. Like, yeah. Give it a day before you tell her she's abandoned, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not straight away. <laughs> I do like that the first person to instantly defend him is Zandra. Zandra's like the one person that comes up with a reason why. Bray wouldn't be around, saying he's probably having a sleep somewhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, very few of them want to come up with any um, alternative. I mean, granted, I think Mm -hmm. it's probably due to the trauma of their world that they jump to the worst case scenario. Uh, Mm -hmm. But yeah, she is one of the few people who's like, there's probably a logical explanation and we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that he's abandoned her. Uh, But I do think it's fascinating how Lex feeds that poison in everybody. Like, mm-hmm. he shouts down any rational reason for why Bray is gone. It must be that he abandoned Trudy. Because <laughs> he wants to believe that Bray of is gone. Because he wants to believe it. And, uh, yeah. it's a very smart um, tactic he uses very often. Mm-hmm. Like, Lex, he doesn't usually come up with solutions. He usually feeds on people's fears of the situation. He's that guy mm-hmm. in the apocalypse scenario. <laughs> <laughs> I think Amber's response is the most fascinating because at that point, she doesn't trust her judgment about Bray anymore. And so she doesn't want to believe he'd abandoned Trudy, but she was wrong about him before. So she doesn't actually come up with an opinion on whether or not he's uh, left. Her first response is, he went out. He didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's completely on Lex's side on that. But you can tell she feels bad about that. Like, she's just looking at the facts. and but She feels bad fact, for Trudy. The facts don't really, they're not in Bray's favor, you know. She's like, he did leave without saying a word, you know, and she's like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at our favorite quotes of the week. 
Yeah, mine had to be obviously from Chloe. I saw some kittens being born once. It was magic. <laughs> I love how she just delivers that, and it was magic. Like, uh, yeah, the delivery on that line. Um, I have a couple. Is it okay that I have a couple? <laughs> Depends if they're not the same as I have. <laughs> okay. Um, I have two that are just silly and funny. They just make me laugh, and then I have two that I just feel like resonate a little bit. Um, that's my special soap from Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I love the way she says it. That's my special soap. You heard the man who's got some soap. You've got some Zandra? And that's my special soap. Zandra, go get the soap. I feel her pain. I just, it's so funny given the situation. They're living in this crashed world. This girl's giving birth. So I'm just <laughs> like the only one with soap. But it's her special soap, guys. This is the way she says it. And, um, oh, and... Amber, she goes, Ryan, do you remember in another lifetime me asking you to get rubber bands? <laughs> Make it a girl. Ah! Ryan, do you remember in another lifetime me asking you to get some rubber bands? Uh, sorry, Amber, um, I couldn't find any. <laughs> it just made me laugh because it's true, he totally went rogue. He never looked at the rubber bands. And the face he pulls. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you did. I couldn't find any. It's like you couldn't tell me. So those two I just think are funny. They make me smile. Um but the two that resonate with me, one is from Chloe. They were all too busy shouting at each other. As if one more person made any difference. She's talking about them all she's talking to Bluebell about them all fighting over oh, whether yeah. or not they mm -hmm. stay now. And she's just like they're too busy fighting to care about anything as if one more person made any difference. And I just love that innocent perspective. It's just another baby. It's just another person in the mall. Why are they making such a fuss, you know? And then Amber, when Lex is upset, when she tries to tell him the baby has changed things and that we're not kicking Trudy and the baby out now. And Lex, of course, is very upset about this and that it's not up to them to take care of this baby. It's not their responsibility. And she says, it's everyone's responsibility, Lex. Can you throw out a helpless child onto the street? It's not our responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility, Lex. Bray's right. What kind of world are we making if we throw out a newborn child and its mother onto the street? It's just one of those moments I really love, Amber. That's a really hard principle to hold on to, given their situation. And yet, she's still holding fast. I just, it's everyone's responsibility, Lex. Yeah, those are good lines. I like those. Mm -hmm. What about you, Sabine? <laughs> now I'm stuck. <laughs> are they different or the same? Same. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. What about you, Hill? Uh, I I still love uh, Jack's line with the whistle. Oh, I've, I've got a whistle. That'll do. Wait. What will you give us if it's a boy? Two whistles? He's so... Just innocent of like not understanding how betting works. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like one of Lex's lines in this. Well, who comes first? Humans or animals? I'm seriously, we can't afford to feed animals unless we're gonna eat them. That's a good line. We can stop feeding that hound for a start. Mm. Unless, of course, you're fattening him up for later. <laughs> it's all right, mm. Come on, stop it, Lex. <laughs> well, who comes first? Humans. Or animals. I'm serious. We can't afford to feed animals unless we're gonna eat them. He's horrible. I had one favorite Lex line. <laughs> He's done a runner, you thickheads. <laughs> <laughs> I love the delivery of that line. Have you kids seen him? No. Of course they haven't. He's done a runner, you thickheads. <laughs> it's a good delivery line. Uh, he's got some great lines in the next episode as well, but yes, we'll come to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, uh, that is, I think next episode is my favorite. Do you have a zinger this week, Hill? I do. So uh, Lex says, Zan, I'm getting desperate. Even Ryan's starting to look appealing. Don't start that again. Oh, Zan, I'm getting desperate. Even Ryan's starting to look appealing. Did you tell him, well, you better try your luck with him. <laughs> yeah. Love that line. That's foreshadowing for the future. 
and Ryan is actually in his bed, uninvited. Yes, <laughs> that's also a very good line. <laughs> So that brings episode four of Conversation Legal Mountain to a close. Uh, thank you once again to the panel. Uh, we are our podcasts are available directly on the website. Uh, we are also now on the iTunes. Just search for the Trial Court UK, and of course, we are available on our YouTube production channel. So until next time, bye, 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 bye.